Okay, it looks like we've got a quorum of our trainees and those that uh, log in on um, the general site as well. Um, so welcome everybody uh, to our next to last uh, neonatal hemodynamics foundations curriculum series lecture. Um, a couple of housekeeping things first. Uh, number one, um, please, if uh, any of you in the general audience have any questions, make sure to put them in the Q&A box. Um, it should be, it's near the chat box. Um, and the chat box can sometimes get filled with other things. And so the Q&A is a really good place for our speaker to be able to see those questions and for us to be able to moderate them. Um, Additionally, uh, we are really interested in getting some feedback about the series in general and then there are specific speakers as well. Um, so please, I'll put this back up at the end of the lecture, but please um, take the QR code and fill out your evaluation after the end of the session. Again, I'll put it back up later. Um, so, um, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's session. Um, Dr. Annie Lapois is an associate professor at University of Montreal and a staff neonatologist at CHU Saint Justine in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. She obtained her medical degree in 2005 and completed residency in general pediatrics at the Laval University in Quebec City in 2008. In 2010, she completed her fellowship in neonatal perinatal medicine at CHU San Justine, and in 2010-11, she received training in T&E at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. She completed her master's degree in cardiovascular physiology from University of Montreal in 2016. Dr. Lapaz's specific research interests include neonatal sepsis, management of PDA, and transitional hemodynamics in extremely preterm infants. So we'd like to welcome you and thank you. Um, and just once again, our trainees, uh, if you would like to have your camera on, um, feel free to do that. If you don't want that at the moment, that's fine. Um, if, there, if, she, if she has any questions uh, and wants to be interactive, feel free to turn your camera on and, and answer and turn your mics off and answer as well. Um, but that's not necessary either. Um, everybody else, uh, again, just put your questions into the Q&A and we will get to those as much as we can um, at the end of this session. Um, so without any further ado, I'll hand over the reins to you. Thank you, Danielle. Let me oh. share my screen. Do you see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So thank you, Danielle, for the kind introduction. Um, I know just that the PS is just passed, and I hope that uh, everyone who went to Washington had good times. It is a pleasure for me today uh, to have the chance to discuss the pathophysiology, hemodynamic assessments, and management of newborns born after a twin-twin transfusion syndrome. I have no conflict of interest to disclose. And our objectives for today are first to review the hemodynamics of the donor and the recipient. Second, to understand the postnatal hemodynamic derangement in clinical management of twin-twin transfusion syndrome. Third, to integrate core principle of physiology and echocardiography into clinical management. And finally, to review congenital heart disease associated with TTTS. Monochorionic placentas are fascinating. About one in five twin pregnancies are monochorionic amniotic. For the rest of the presentation, let's say monodi pregnancies. Monodi placentas always share virtual anastomosis, and blood flow through this placental anastomosis is bidirectional and normally balanced. When intertwin exchange is more than 10 to 15% unbalanced, one fetus becomes the donor and the other becomes the recipient. That's the start of the uh, TTTS presentation. 
the condition may stay stable, regress, or evaluate to a severe condition with high risk of fetal mortality or severe complication. It is primordial to, def to define the chorionicity of twin pregnancies as the follow-up need to be adapted. In current practice, the prevalence of uh, TTTS is one to three per 10,000 births. It complicates around 10% of monodi twin pregnancies. CTTS may develop at any time during pregnancy, and if it occurs before 13 to 14 weeks gestation, the syndrome is often undiagnosed and terminates in single or dual demise. In second trimester, particularly between 16 to 26 weeks gestation, amnion reduction or laser therapy can be offered. The last brought major improvement in outcomes since its apparitions two decades ago. The syndrome is suspected when there is apparition of an amniotic disturbances in a, a monodi pregnancy. TTTS uh, needs two uh, ultrasound criteria. The first is the presence of a monochorionic pregnancy, and the second is the presence of oligohydromyous and polyhydromyous. Also, a growth discordance, usually defined as more than 20%, and IUGR often complicate TTTS. However, both are not diagnostic criteria. If virtually all monodi twins uh, are a share communicating placental vessel, why do only some develop the syndrome? The answer is mainly in the uh, anastomosis that we can find in the placenta. There are three types of anastomosis, arteriovenous anastomosis are uh, deep and can be donor to recipients or recipient to donor, and typically both types coexist. These anastomoses are usually multiple and overall balanced in both directions so uh, that TTTS does not occur. The syndrome will occur when the net flow across these multiples arteriovenous anastomosis favors a donor to recipient direction. Arterio, um, arterial and venovenous anastomosis are direct connection vessel to vessel and are not connected to capillary beds, so that, as it is the case for the arteriovenous anastomosis. In TTTS, the chronic blood reduction in the donor induce an upregulation of the renin angiotensis system. The recipient twin faces a high blood volume combined with a paradoxical activation of his renin angiotensis system because of the transfer of effectors such as angiotensin II through the placental shunts. This leads to an increased systemic vascular resistance, elevated, elevated blood pressure, and subsequent fetal cardiomyopathy in the recipient. Both ventricles are affected, leading to cardiomegaly, ventricular hypertrophy, and atrioventricular valve regurgitation when myocardial, uh, myocardial function uh, fails. Diastolic dysfunction precedes the systolic dysfunction with the right ventricle involved at an earlier age than the left ventricle. We will see later right ventricle outflow tract obstruction and pulmonary stenosis may be observed in the recipient. Interestingly, the donor twin is rare, rarely affected by significant hemodynamic impairment. So to repeat in more details, let's see with the donor. The donor experiment uh, renal hypoperfusion and oliguria. Then oligohydromyous will develop 
those factors will contribute to a renal dysplasia and renal atrophy, then the donor will activate his renin angiotensis system and we will see an increase of the antidiuretic hormone. And then the arterial resistance in placenta is increased, which will bring uh, to the IUGR presentation. In the recipient now, as said before, the recipient faces hypervolemia. The hypervolemia will bring atrial distension, and we will see an increase of the atrial natriuretic peptides. Then the glomerular, glomerular filtration will increase, the tubular reabsorption will decrease, and we will see the apparition of the polyuria and polyhydromyus. The recipient we will have a suppression of his fetal RAS, but high level of renin and angiotensin occur by the transfer from the donor and by the increasing of the placental production. The antidiuretic hormone seems to be suppressed, which will add um, a factor to the polyuria and po polyhydromyus. And regarding the heart, the increased cardiac troponin and the BNP uh, will bring structural damage and remodeling of myo myocardium. Recipients have a higher concentration of endothelin 1, which will add uh, structural damage and remod abnormal remodeling of the myocardium. Then hy hypertension will occur and a cardiac failure. When left untreated, severe TTTS evolution results in fetal demise of one or two twins in 80 to 90% of the case. It ends by the development of eye drops on both fetuses, donor due to anemia and high output heart failure, and recipient secondary to maladaptation to hypervolemia. In 60% of the case, the donor will die first and the death of the co-twin is common and follow death of the first twin within hour. Surviving twins after a TTTS um, in utero have 25 to 30% risk of severe neurological or cardiac uh, anomalies. To follow those very high pregnancies, the staging system described by uh, Quintero in 1999 um, is the staging the most widely used today. It is simple and facilitates referrals and communication between healthcare providers. Stage one describes the amniotic fluid volume discordance the donor hypovolemia is mild and urine production is still adequate. The bladder uh, feels it is visible in this twin. Once the oliguria occurs and the bladder is no longer observed to fail, the disease is classified as stage two. In stage three, abnormal doppers um, can be seen, indicating high systemic vascular resistance and or a failing heart. If eye drops is present in either twin, the disease has entered the stage four and finally fetal demise of one or both twins is term stage five. In the effort to better describe the prediction of cardiovascular evolution of TTTS twin, some authors developed new staging system. For example, the CHOP score, which incorporates parameters of diastatic dysfunction in the recipient uh, twin with the evaluation, evaluation of 12 variables, but it takes 35 to 45 minutes. So it's not really feasible in routine clinical practices. Another one, the Cincinnati staging system used the tie index of both ventricles for the donor and uh, the recipient. 
the op um, the option for the management uh, of TTTS are expectative, probably for stage one or two. Amyor reduction probably when laser is not possible or too early or late in pregnancy. Fetal laser uh, uh, therapy, which kind of revolution the outcomes of TTTS in the last two decades, or selective reduction of one twin. Of notice, Amyor reduction does not treat the TTTS, the only effective treatment that can effectively halt, uh, halt the syndrome is the uh, laser therapy. The laser therapy, when um, it is done, um, it's mainly between the 15 and 26 weeks of gestation. It became the gold standard in many centers. The goal is to halt the syndrome and improve hemodynamic function of both fetuses and to protect one twin against the vascular steel in case of a co-twin death. Complications are possible, um, for example, premature rupture of membrane, preterm delivery, amniotic liquid, vaginal bleeding, and or abruptio, uh, chorioamnionitis. How it is done, for example, in this figure, on the left, we have the donor with oligohydromyus, and this twin is stuck behind the intertwin membrane. Endoscopic instrument is inserted in the recipient's polyhydromyus sac, and the laser beam aims at placental anastomosis between donor and recipient. Any vessel seen crossing the enter twin membrane at the equator is photo photocoagulated. At the end of the procedure, any significant amniotic fluid is removed from the recipient sac. As said before, it arrests shunting of blood and how the transfer of potential vasoactive mediator. In the 48 hours following laser therapy, half of the recipients will have normalization of their cardiac size, normalization of their Doppler, valvular regurgitation, and ventricular inflow. The MPI improves in approximately 40% of them. In fact, even, even severe cardiac dysfunction, such as functional pulmonary atresia and high drops seem to resolve in almost all cases, which is an argument against the use of selective reduction in these fetuses. A slightly reduced early diastolic ventricular filling may persist as compared to donors and recipient remain at an increased risk of occurrence of a right ventricular outflow tract obstruction and pulmonary stenosis at the time of birth. In contrast, the donor twin seems to experience a temporary worsening in cardiac function with uh, an increase um, of the cardiac size, abnormality in uh, Dopplers, and the development of subcutaneous edema. It seems to be secondary to relative hypervolemia with abrupt increase in afterloads. There are mixed uh, results in survival after laser therapy, and several reasons may explain that. Um, this is an invasive technique. Many of those twins are delivered premature. Some fetuses are too sick to be able to recover from the procedure. Sometimes there is persistence of anastomosis. The placental share of some donors is too small and placental vascular resistance is really high uh, and can worsen the cardiac function, leading to high drops in this twin. Advanced disease in the recipient can be worsened with the laser therapy secondary to an exaggerated cardiovascular response. Overall, in clinical trials, survival of at least one twin after laser therapy varies from 70 to 90%. 
sometimes we have failure of laser therapy in the twin twin trans transfusion syndrome. Uh, there is 5% risk of recurrence. We can sometimes observe a reverse TTTS. So the donor becomes the recipient and the recipient becomes the donor. And sometimes we can see the apparition of a TAPS syndrome, um, which is a blood discordance without the hallmark of the TTTS. Uh, we don't go into detail today. It was mainly focused on the TTTS, uh, but sometimes uh, this is something uh, we see after laser therapy. So we need to monitor the fetal cardiac function in fetuses with twin-twin transfusion syndrome. So the cardiac dimension need to be uh, followed. Cardiac function, of course, obstetrician can do M mode, MPI, strain when it is available. For example, here at St. Justine, we don't do strain yet, but it is described. We need to monitor the left and right ventricular inflows. We need to detect congenital heart disease because they are at higher risk and we will see later. And of course, Doppler of umbilical vein in ductus venosus, which can give um, clues about the right uh, atrial pressure. So congenital heart disease are more frequent uh, in both twin, the donor and the recipient. For the recipient, the volume overload and increased afterload will increase the pulmonary and aortic velocities, cardiomegaly develops, and atrioventricular regurgitation occur. There is then a progressive biventricular cardiac hypertrophy, diastolic dysfunction, and poor RV function will follow. The pathophysiology of the development for the right ventricular outflow tract obstruction in recipient is explained by altered flow in the, uh, across the pulmonary valve with the progressive dilation of the, of the right ventricle, diastolic dysfunction, and worsening of the atrioventricular valve incompetency. This reduces the flow across the pulmonary valve, leading to a pulmonary stenosis pulmonary atresia or pulmonary insufficiency. The failure of the right ventricle through um, non-compliance or diastolic dysfunction can be demonstrated by the, the follow-up in the ductus venosus Doppler. As the dysfunction progress, the diastolic waveform will fuse and the Doppler inflow will regress, supporting the notion that the right ventricle outflow tract obstruction is caused by a diminished forward flow through the right heart. There, there are some uh, mediators also involved, um, ANP, antidiuretic hormone, endotelin-1, angiotensin-2, VEGF, or all have been described uh, with a certain role in the development of the RVOTO and pulmonic stenosis uh, in recipient. For the donor, although the structure, structural heart disease is less commonly observed prenatally, these babies appear to be at a greater risk of coarctation of the aorta. Their mechanism of coarctation in the donor twin is thought to be related to the relatively hypovolemic state, which results in reduced blood flow through the aorta and reduced growth of the aortic arch. So now in general, TTTS twins have more congenital heart disease. They have 9% or 12-fold higher uh, risk than the general population. This is a complex interaction among multiple variables. For example, right from the beginning, by unequal division of the inner cell mass, disturbance of laterality, and by phenotyping variability of the same genome, results in discordant cardiovascular anatomy. 
Also, growth of fetal cardiac structure is dependent on the blood flow through them. Some medi mediator also are uh, may be involved. I've been de described involved. For example, VEGF or angiotensin two. TTTS twins have more also ASD and VSD, probably uh, by um, ischemic necrosis or excessive natriuretic proteins. And again, just to repeat, the recipient have more uh, right ventricular outflow tract obstruction and the donor more left-sided obstruction lesion. Now to res resume what we uh, can assess during the fetal heart monitoring in the recipient, Doppler assessment of the uh, four chambers view in the recipient can demonstrate mitral and tricuspid regurg. We can have abnormal uh, MPI or tie index, decrease systolic function uh, with a decreased shortening fraction, abnormal EA ratio in both ventricle, mainly decrease, abnormal spicule tracking, abnormal Doppler um, waveform, and RV hypertrophy, which lead to uh, pulmon pulmonary stenosis and pulmonary atresia. Sometimes those baby have calcification around the aorta and or around the pulmonary artery, secondary to a chronic pressure overload and increased shear stress, leading to hyperplasia of the intima and the media and coronary artery changes. In donor, tricuspid regurg may be seen, but it's not frequent. However, when it is present, it tends to be severe. MPI tends to be low, maybe reflecting a hypotensive state. Shortening fraction can be decreased. EA ratio in both ventricle can be decreased too. Abnormal speckle tracking can be also abnormal. Umbilical artery can show uh, the apparition of absent or reverse end diastolic flow um, which represent the development of the IUGR. Ductus venosus and umbilical vein Doppler can be abnormal, and uh, sometimes the correctation of the aorta uh, may be detected. That was the, mainly the initial physiology that I think was uh, important to understand. What we see postnatally takes its origin in the antenatal cardiovascular disturbance. After birth, the recipient is uh, more often the seeker. The recipient can present with a higher birth weight, polycythemia, high blood pressure or hypotension, high lactates, acidosis, cardiomegaly or cardiac dysfunction. Maybe HIE presentation if the transition after birth um, did not uh, go well, or sometimes we can have um, high drop presentation. When I have cardiovascular instability in a recipient twin, I tend to um, organize the um, possibility uh, with a disfigure. Are we facing a critical pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary atresia that need to be detected by uh, a, a echocardiography after birth? And we need to adapt the management. Is it the presentation of a severe hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? It needs also to be detected and management to be adapted. Is it a severe diastolic or systolic dysfunction? Or is it the presentation of a PPHN? For the PPHN presentation in recipient, mechanism is unknown. However, hypotheses are difficult transition after birth, polycythemia, chronic volume overloading that induce shear stress in vessels or a mechanical strain, maybe vaso 
constrictive mediators such as angiotensin II and endotelin uh, may play also a role. Just to remind, um, if we have a severe cyanosis in the recipient of third birth, uh, we, uh, we discussed about that earlier, they can have pulmonary, severe pulmonary atresia and critical pulmonary stenosis. If it is the case, the treatment needs to be adapted and we need to ensure uh, the pulmonary blood flow. And for those cases, prostaglandine have a big role to play in their uh, management. Recently, a European group uh, published um, a paper on hemodynamics after birth in recipients. It was a retrospective study of 43 recipients with no laser therapy in utero, and they described three clinical presentation in the first five days of life. The first group uh, was, were recipients with no hemodynamic impairments. The second group were recipients with isolated high blood pressure. And the third group was um, uh, recipients with cardiac failure defined by a LV dysfunction. All of them had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the mortality uh, were mainly in the cardiac failure group. The incidence was 40% of uh, the recipients in the cardio failure group. And they described the blood pressure profile of uh, th uh, those uh, three groups. Mainly here, what is represented, it's the uh, cardiac failure group and the high blood pressure group. We can see the cardiac failure group um, have had a decrease of their blood pressure in the first 12 hours of life. The cardiac failure group also um, had a decrease of their urine outputs rapidly after birth. That brings me to discuss with you about uh, postnatal renal manifestation in TTTS. In 2020, we published here at St. Justine our cohort on um, donor and recipient twins uh, who had laser in utero, and we compared them with the chorionic diamuric twins. And what we found was uh, mainly the creatinine level and urine output was uh, lower. The creatinine level was higher and the urine output was lower in the uh, TTTS group. And it tends to uh, improve around two weeks of life. Activation of the RES in donor and paradoxical increase of the RES by the transfer to the donor, to the recipient, cause hypertensive microangiopathic changes and loss in, this, in density of proximal tubules. Okay, that was the first part of the presentation. Now for the next part, um, I tried to incorporate clinical cases with some important physiologic points to discuss. The first uh, clinical case uh, is a recipient twin born at 28 plus four weeks of gestation by C-section. The birth weight was uh, 1.2 kilo and the APGOR score were eight, eight uh, and eight. So the transition went well. The mother was a 36 years old woman on her second pregnancy. The first echo during the first trimester, the, tw the twins uh, were described monodi with no sign of TTTS initially. The echo done in the second trimester at 22 weeks of gestation, morphology of both twins were, uh, were normal, no sign of TTTS and no sign of TAPS syndrome. However, at 28 plus two weeks of gestation, oligopoly sequence was seen the twin A had cardiomegaly and twin B had uh, abnormal dopplers. So betamethasone was given to the mother and um, the twins were bo born two days later. 
the recipient was um, was doing well initially, he needed Lisa and was then intubated at 12 hours of life for high FI2 requirement. Ventilation was uh, what we expected, PEEP of seven, and blood gas was also what we can expect in a 28-weeker intubated. However, during the first night, this baby had a persistent hypoxia despite 100% of oxygen. And the medical team at, at that time tried nitrocoxide and HFO, and it did not change something, and it was not tolerated. This baby underwent hypotension and was given two bodices of normal saline. Uh, then the urine output decreased to uh, 0.7 cc per kilo per hour, cap refill increased, urea was increased at 14 and creatinine also was uh, increased to 130 mic micromole per liter. With this evolution, the medical team asked for an echo. Uh, the first echo was done at 6 a.m. in the morning. It was done by our cardiology team here at St. Justine. And that was uh, this first echo. So can I have someone, one of our trainees, to comment on, um, on that echo? If there is no volunteer, there is, can, there, uh, go there is obstruction. There is obstruction of, of the left ventricle outflow track. So this is a long axis. You're talking about maybe a little obstruction. It was not a big obstruction with other views. Mainly the right ventricle. I don't know if you agree. Was a bit increasing. Um, a bit hypertrophic uh, and maybe with some kind of dysfunction. So we then uh, had a short access view. Carolina, would you like to continue for the short access view? Uh, Yeah, well, I, I see him as well uh, hypertrophy of the right ventricle. I don't, well, there's no Doppler, but um, we can see that the, that the curvature, uh, it's flattened. Yes, so from the short axis view, the right ventricle, it's like obvious now, the right ventricle were hypertrophic and probably dysfunctional. And I agree with you that the septal curve was, um, was flat. I think, well, at least from this view, it looks like probably there's biventricular dysfunction with biventricular hypertrophy. Yes. So we will see from the subcostal view that both ventricles were hypertrophic. I'll show you after this one. Uh, what was interesting in this case, in the view of the right ventricle outflow track, we were able to see hyperechogenicity. And oh, I don't know if you uh, remember, we just discussed about calcification that we can see uh, sometimes in the recipient, secondary to shear stress and mechanical um, stress, uh, secondary to uh, hypervolemia. Uh, so that was uh, the explanation for, for this finding. The VTI done in the main pulmonary artery was decreased, um, meaning that less integrated flow uh, was present. EA ratio of the mitral valve was decreased. And from the subcostal view, oh, this, this one is not working, but we, we were able to see the both uh, hypertrophy, um, hyper, 
both ventricular hypertrophy it was mainly the right ventricle than the left ventricle, uh, but it was uh, present for both. So the conclusion of uh, this echo was a severe biventricular hypertrophy, right ventricle more than the left. Shortening fraction was um, normal by emote. The right ventricle was uh, with dysfunction, systolic and diastolic. The PFO was right to left. The septal curve was flat, type 2, with a dyskinetic intraventricular septum. No PDA was seen. Small TR was noticed, probably reflecting the right ventricle dysfunction. The TR was uh, described small. No intragradient, uh, really intracardiac uh, gradient. Type C was decreased at four. Right ventricular output also decreased at 50, which is low. EA ratio of both ventricles was decreased and calcification of the anterior pulmonary annulus in anterior and fundibulum was described. The medical team at that time uh, decided to uh, start the butamine, um, mainly to really help the right ventricle function. We can argue that uh, when we have a severe biventricular hypertrophy, the start of inotrope um, sometimes can uh, bring deterioration of this patient. However, for, for this patient, it really helped, um, but that was the choice at that time. And they started also nitric oxide at uh, 20, 20 ppm. That was the blood pressure profile of this patient uh, in the first 30 hours of life. Initially, this recipient have high blood pressure, and it was quite unstable, variable, until a decreasing in, in probably hypotension for the medical team at that time. And they, they, um, they did the echo and decided to start the dobutamine, increase the dose to 10, and it was more stable after. The echo done five hours after the start of the butamine uh, showed an increased TR at 20 millimeter of mercury, higher than the first, probably reflecting an improvement of the right ventricle. Intraventricular septum was still dyskinetic. Right ventricle uh, was still hypertrophic. Type C was a bit uh, better. EA ratio of both ventricle was a bit also improved and E on E prime uh, on the mitral valve was uh, decreased. The clinical response to the butamine was uh, good. Uh, ventilation was um, easy with a PEEP decreased to five. If IO2 requirement went back to 45% and urine output um, increased to 5.4 cc per kilo per hour. The blood gases also improve over time. Here uh, was the start of the dobutamine. This baby was extubated at day of life uh, four uh, on non-invasive ventilation in 25% of oxygen. That was great. Unfortunately, at day of life five, he had a spontaneous intestinal perforation secondary to intestinal atresia. So he needed surgery, he needed to be reintubated, and was then extubated at day of life eight. Um, and the renal function normalized at day of life 10. At day of life 19, this baby was back on CPAP with 21 to 25% of oxygen, almost full PO, and head ultrasound were uh, normal at that point. The echo done at day of life 19 showed improvement of the right ventricle hypertrophy. The LV function was normal. Type C uh, also improved and the diastolic function of the right ventricle also improved. So this evolution uh, makes me to introduce the cardiac manifest manifestation after birth and a relation with a brain injury. Recipient or donors are described in this um, 
paper in 2019. This is a prospective study. And uh, they uh, compare recipient and donors with brain injury or no brain injury. And brain injury were uh, assessed with brain MRI or head ultrasound. Hypotension in the first week of life and immediate uh, postnatal cardiac manifestation were more prevalent in the brain injury group. In their multivariate analysis, acute kidney injury and cardiac manifestation were associated with brain injury. And other injuries related to hemodynamic derangements uh, can occur in those uh, patients. The renal failure occur around 48% of survivor. Some will have renal uh, cortical necrosis. Intestinal atresia is described. That was the case for our patient. Cutis aplasia is described limb necrosis and other ischemic lesion, hemolytic jaundice and thromboembolic phenomena are also described. Now to go back in our case at 36 weeks of corrected gestational age, the right ventricle function was, uh, high, the right ventricle hypertrophy was mild. The biventricular systolic function was normal, type C again, continued to improve, diastolic function two, and septal curve was described at one. So overall an improved diastolic function and a regression of cardiac hypertrophy. Just before the discharge, the echo was totally normal. This baby was discharged at day of life 138 in room air and full feet. And unfortunately at 18 months, during the neurodevelopmental follow-up, this baby had abnormal development, spastic dysplasia, and was referred to uh, a readaptation clinic. And that brings me to uh, talk with you about the long-term consequences of a twin-twin transfusion syndrome. Brain injuries uh, can be uh, related to the hemodynamic derangements in twin-twin transfusion syndrome. Antenatal ischemic brain lesion uh, are described. It is worse if one co-twin dies. It can happen also when both twins survive, uh, the, then the neurological damages are due to polycythemia and venous st stasis in recipient or uh, anemia and hypotension in donor. In 2018, we uh, published a retrospective study on TTTS with or, or without laser therapy in utero and compared them with diametic dichorionic twins. What we saw is that at 18 months um, of corrected gestational age, uh, TTTS twins without in utero laser had worse neurodevelopmental outcome. And when laser was done, no significant difference compared to the diamiotic dichorionic twins were found. We think that the hypothesis plausible is that laser therapy by improvement of cardiovascular disturbances seems to improve also the long-term uh, neurodevelopmental outcome. Another long-term consequences of uh, TTTS is the chronic systemic hypertension. It was described that at two years old, they still have high systolic and diastolic blood pressure compared to um, a normal cohort. However, it was reassuring that at 10 years old, they, when they had the chance of having laser therapy during the pregnancy, they tend to normalize their, their blood pressure and the cardiac function. The hypothesis um, to explain that is uh, the exposition to angiotensin II and endothelin I would increase shear stress on the vascular endothelium, causing vasoconstriction and vessel remodeling. Now, I have a second case 
this, this one is quicker and I think we have time to, uh, to, to do it and have a couple of key point discussion. This is again a recipient born at 26 plus two weeks of gestation for a sta an aggressive stage two, uh, stage three TTTS evolution. Betamethasone was given, birth weight was seven, 780 gram. He was intubated for RDS and received surfactant. Hypotension uh, occurred initially and received two bodices. And this recipient also had acute renal injury with oliguria and high creatinine. The first echo done in the uh, 20, first 24 hours, surprisingly, show the P a large PDA with a bidirectional shunt, a reverse flow in aorta, some kind of uh, hemodynamically significant PDA, but the biventricular function uh, was normal and no cardiac hypertrophy was found. only to show the big PDA uh, bidirectional. Then the evolution of this 26 weeker was, I can say typical with no major complication. He was described to have a persistent murmur uh, that was attributed to a uh, persistent ductus arteriosus. At day of life 60, he had um, a cardiac echo um, at 35 weeks of corrected gestation age, gestational age. And um, what I show you here, it's mainly the right ventricle outflow track. And um, when we put Doppler color, mainly in the subcostal view, we saw some acceleration um, in the right uh, outflow track. And this baby had a pulmonary stenosis that was present with a gradient around 53 millimeter of mercury. The narrowing was mainly at the level of the valve. And in the gradation of pulmonary stenosis, this baby was described with a moderate pulmonary stenosis with a pressure gradient of 40 to 80 millimeter of mercury and the RV systolic pressure uh, was above half systemic pressure. Um, and that brings me to uh, talk with you about the distribution of right ventricular outflow track anomalies after birth. In 2015, Michel Felder described what we can ex expect when we have a recipient with right ventricle outflow tract abnormalities in utero. Um, he found that when we have um, pulmonary insufficiency, it tends to normalize. When we have pulmonary stenosis, it tends to um, stay after birth. And when we have pulmonary atresia, some of them will resolve and some will uh, stay with their pulmonary atresia. Um, so a speculative, it is possible that cir circulating peptides may impact pulmonary valve morphogenesis. For example, angiotensin. Uh, angiotensin receptors exist throughout the developing heart. Uh, and we know that angiotensin levels are elevated in recipient twins, but it stays um, an hypothesis for the moment. So this baby was discharged at day of life 159 at 49 weeks of corrected gestational age on home oxygen. Uh, the pulmonary stenosis never needed intervention. So now uh, in the follow-up, the pulmonary stenosis is mild. Neurodevelopmental outcomes uh, was also bad for this baby with this spastic dysplasia and neurosensorial deafness. Okay, so that was it. Con in conclusion, um, TTTS twins have a unique physiology that starts in utero and dictates postnatal presentation. Recipients are often sicker and can present with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, 
diastolic and systolic dysfunction, pulmonary atresia, pulmonary stenosis, or PPHN. Laser therapy had improved outcomes in the last two decades. Echocardiography, of course, after birth, helped in the uh, understanding of what uh, is the underlying physiology. And TTTS twins have more long-term neurodevelopmental outcome, um, bad neurodevelopmental outcome, chronic systemic hypertension, and uh, potential altered renal function. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, that was a great presentation and a lot of information. 